Thanks. Okay, so yeah, welcome everyone uh, to, I guess, the third meeting of this session of the Midwest Computability Seminar. I'm very happy to have Chris Eisentrager here talking about a topological approach to undefinability and algebraic extensions of the rationals. Okay. Thank you, Dennis, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak here in the seminar. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, joint work with Russell Miller, um, who's in the audience, and my graduate student, Caleb Springer, and also my colleague from Penn State, Linda Westrick. And so the main question that we were considering was the following. So we are looking at the rationals and then some algebraic extension of the rationals. So sitting inside Q bar. And then we have the ring of integers sitting inside the in uh, L and we have the integers in Q. And so we have this uh, picture here. And so we wanna, the sort of the main question that at least I was interested in from the get go was the following, namely, when is this ring OL, the ring of integers existentially definable in L. And so I'm gonna define in a little bit what ring of it, what the definition is for the ring of integers. So the only thing like while I'm sort of talking about the motivation of the problem is uh, that it's a ring and it contains Z. So it's a sub ring of L. Okay, and so if you, you just sort of look at the easy sort of base case of this question, um, so that would be the case where L is just the rationals themselves. Then this ring of integers is just the integers. And so then the question becomes is Z, are the integers existentially definable in Q? And uh, so why might we be interested in a question like that? So well, if the integers are indeed existentially definable in Q, then Hilbert's 10th problem for Q is undecidable. There is no algorithm to decide whether polynomials with coefficients in Q have solutions in Q. And uh, that is uh, a big open problem, which also means that this question that I posed looks like it's way too difficult if I can't even say anything about the base case. And so what's the way around this? Well, rather than picking a specific L and ask, is this ring existentially definable in it? I could just ask a question about the collection of all L that have this property. And so, I think uh, it so it was Russell who sort of uh, suggested this kind of uh, approach to it to instead look at the set of all L not so contained in Q bar OL is existentially definable in L. And what we're going to try and do instead is we're going to show that this set is small 
in a topological sense. And so that means I'm going to introduce a topology on the set of all algebraic extensions of Q. And then I'm going to show that this set S is meager with that topology. So that is sort of the big picture of what the outline is for the entire talk. And now I want to go a little bit more into detail of like uh, how these pieces all fit together. So, um, so let me start by sort of um, saying what the connection is to Hilbert's 10th problem. That is also sort of um, uh, so one of the questions that's uh, very dear to me and I've uh, worked on it quite a bit. So, um, so let me start just with the original problem, which uh, I'm sure um, is a, so let me just recall what the original problem over the integers looked like. So we're looking at multivariate polynomial equations over the integers, and we want to have an algorithm that can decide whether such polynomial equations have solutions also in the integers. Now, uh, famously, Matiasevich proved in 1970, based on work by Martin Davis, Hilary Putnam, and Julia Robinson, that this is not possible. And I will refer to this as saying that Hilbert's 10th problem, which I'm just going to abbreviate by H10, that this is a problem is undecidable. Okay, so I said there's a connection here to Hilbert's 10th problem over the rationals. And of course, there is no, you can just ask the same question as before. And now in the same Thing everywhere where I wrote Z in the previous problem, I can now write the rationals. And uh, so now I have multivariate polynomial equations with coefficients in Q. I can even scale those and make them integer uh, coefficients in the integers if I want to. But now the uh, difference is that I want to know if there is a solution where the x1 through xn are rational numbers. And that is probably still arguably the biggest open problem in the area and even harder than say Hilbert's 10th problem over the rationals would be replacing the rationals with say a finite extension of the rationals. Say some, so that's what we call a number field. So we also don't know what's the, what, what does it look like if we want to know the answer for Hilbert's 10th problem over Q joins square root of two or Q joins square root of five and the Q root of seven, things like that. So, so we don't really know. And, uh, but so why did I bring up the original problem? Well, I brought up the original problem because it's uh, interesting that almost, well, okay, I think, so actually every, literally every single undecidability proof beyond the original proof over the integers is uses some kind of reduction argument. So, so that means we're using the fact that it can't be done over the integers to get the results for uh, other uh, rings or fields as well. And so what is the, uh, what is the, what is the fact that we need in order to be able to uh, make this generalization? Uh, one way to do it is if Z is existentially definable in Q, then we can show that Hilbert's 10th problem over Q must also be decidable through like a reduction argument. And so here I'm saying existentially definable and because I'm talking about definability inside a field, the rationals, I, I don't have to make the distinction between existentially definable or positive existentially definable. If you've seen me give other talks uh, 
I, I usually, this is usually where I introduce the notion of diophantine sets, but since we're going into a different direction here, I'm not going to talk about those, but positive existentially definable sets are the diophantine sets. Um, and so we want to know, is Z existentially definable in Q or same question, is Z diophantine over Q? Because that would resolve the biggest probe uh, um, open problem in this area. And um, well, the, um, so the uh, proof of the lemma is a reduction argument. So I'm claiming if I have such a positive existential definition of Z and Q, then I could actually get from an algorithm for Q, an algorithm for Z, which would be a contradiction. And, and so let me just say it in words. It's uh, so if I have some equation and I, I can, after scaling it, I can, so I have an equation and I wanna know, does it have an integer solution? So I'm trying to get a uh, algorithm for the problem over Z. And uh, if I assume that there is an algorithm for Hilbert's 10th problem over Q, I can at least answer the question, does it have a rational solution? But now because Z, I'm assuming that Z is existentially definable in Q, I can also ask for each element that shows up in the solution, I can say, uh, does it satisfy the uh, equation that defines Z in Q? Meaning is, it, is the solution that I found, can I actually make it an integer solution? So, and then, so I can put all of this together and that would tell me whether the uh, equation, not just whether it has a solution over Q, but also whether it has an integer solution. And uh, so that's the, uh, by Matyasevich's theorem, we know no algorithm over the integers uh, exists. And so that means we also can solve the problem over Q if we have this existential definition of the integers inside Q. Okay, so uh, now, Oops. All right, so now the question is, so is Z existentially definable in Q? So what's the answer here? Um, it looks like a hard question. Um, well, so we may not be able to prove it, but uh, if you believe Barry Maser and his conjecture, then the answer is no. And so this is the conjecture that uh, is talks about a variety over Q. And the conjecture is that the topological closure of such a variety inside the reals can only have finitely many connected components. And so if this conjecture holds and it's only been proved for curves so far, then uh, Z would not be existentially definable in Q. On the other hand, if you ask any algebraic geometer or number theorist, uh, they do not believe that Hilbert's 10th problem over Q is decidable. So all this means is that the problem over Q would just, it's, it would just need a different approach. This reduction argument might just not the way, might just not be the way to uh, approach this. Okay, so, um, so that seems to be too difficult. So now, I want to move to sort of viewing all the problems together. So I want to look at the algebraic closure of Q and the technical definition of the ring of integers. It's just everything inside a field 
that can be expressed as a root of a monic polynomial with integer coefficients. So for example, if I just take the field Q adjoint the cube root of three, uh, square root of three, then I can, I can prove that the ring of integers is just Z adjoint the square root of three and the square root of three is clearly a root of a monic polynomial with coefficients in z adjoint x, namely it's just the root of x squared minus three. And um, you can like prove abstractly that the elements OL that have this property that they form a ring. And uh, so this is sort of uh, one of the main objects that is studied in like sort of uh, first algebraic number theory course and uh, really the only property that we need is that these rings of integers have the property that if you intersect them with the base field Q, you just end up with the uh, integers again. So you have, so you have OL sitting inside L. So OL contains Z because every element in Z is a, is a root of a monic polynomial with coefficients in Z. So it looks like this. And so if we intersect this ring OL with Q, we just end up with Z. And so, Okay, so now we wonder, so, so this is the question I'd like to answer, that's too hard. And so now I'm going to sort of switch to the uh, view of topology of looking at the collection of sets that have this property. And before I do that, let me just say, so I sort of said the problem is really hard and sort of left it at that. But uh, what kind of stuff do we actually know about maybe if we, maybe not existential definability, but just definability in general, what can we actually say in these extensions of the rationals? So, uh, so there are some things known, at least when uh, our field in question is a finite extension of Q, uh, meaning it, it, one can show that's equivalent to just being uh, generated by one single algebraic element over the rationals. So these are the number fields, um, what are called number fields. And uh, Julia Robinson showed back in 1959 that the ring of integers is always first order definable in K. And then recently uh, over the last 12 years, there were several improvements to Julia Robinson's original result and uh, sort of the best result that one arrived at was that uh, you can define the ring of integers using only for all quantifiers inside any number field. So the question about the existential definability is still uh, open, but uh, all of these finite extensions, for all these finite extensions, you can do it using only for all quantifiers. So that was done by Jochen Königsmann for Z and Q. And then by Jennifer Park, she did the general case for rings of integers and number fields. Now, this problem becomes a lot more difficult when we're allowing these extensions to be infinite because the uh, result by Königsmann and Park, um, it uses the finiteness of the class group which, me, which only works if we're actually in a finite extension of the rational. So um, when we're allowing ourselves to look at infinite extensions, um, we're getting only very special um, examples of fields where we can still, still say ring of integers is first order definable. So I mentioned some of the names of people who worked on this. Um, so that's, definability and even just first order definable ability. How about proving that things are not definable? Um, well, you can show that the totally real integers are not definable in the uh, inside the field of uh, Q totally real um, because the one has a decidable first order theory and the other one doesn't. Um, 
I don't know off, off the top of my head if there are any other examples you can just write down like that. So it seems really hard to even just pin down one specific field where you can say, here it's not possible to find this inside the other, the, this ring inside the field. Um, sorry, can you say for a second what totally real means? Sorry. I yeah, totally that. real means that um, every embedding, um, so you, you can embed your field inside the complex numbers in various different ways. And if every embedding um, um, maps into the real numbers, you call that uh, number field totally real. Okay, so for thanks. example, Q adjoint square root of two would be totally real because you can map the square root of two to itself or to minus the square root of two. Whereas something like um, Q adjoint the cube root of two would not be totally real because the cube root of two, the X cubed minus two has one real root and two complex conjugate roots. Yeah. So, okay. So, so let's look at the, see if we can say something about the collection of all fields with this property. So we're going to look at the following space. Namely, we're going to look at all fields that sit inside Q bar. So it's just a different way of saying, so all these fields are still gonna contain the real number, uh, sorry, the rational numbers. And um, they, um, so these are all going to be algebraic extensions of Q and these will be exactly the algebraic extensions of Q. And the topology we're going to put on it is we're going to say the, if I specify a given element A and I'm looking at the fields that contain that element, that's gonna be a clopen set. And I can also write down a very nice basis for this topology. Namely, if I can just, if I just specify uh, a finite set of elements A so that I say, uh, I'm looking at all the fields that contain these finitely many elements from A. And then I have a second set B of things that my field is supposed to avoid. So if I look at all the uh, fields L that contain the set, the elements in A, but avoid the elements in B, then this forms a basis of the topology. And uh, now, so, I'm claiming that um, we can show that S is the set oops, of where in which um, the ring of integers is existentially definable is a meager set. Um, but in order for this to have some kind of meaning, I have to at least say what do the meager or the non-meager sets look like in such a space? So if, if uh, so I, I'd like to know what kind of property does sub Q bar have with this topology that I just put on it? And so the definition that I'm going to need here is the definition of uh, being nowhere dense. So that's another notion of being small, but it's a more restrictive notion. So we're going to call a set S of a subset of a topological space. We're going to say it's nova dense. If, if you give me any non-empty open set U, I can find another non-empty open set V that sits inside U and that only in, and that intersects S in the empty set. And then the meager sets are just sets that can be expressed at countable as countable unions of nowhere dense sets. So both of these notions are supposed to be no notions of being small because we have this uh, intersection property with open sets, which are thought of as big. And uh, so for each one, we can find an open subset that intersects in the empty set. And uh, so the reason why showing that a set is meager inside 
as a subset, uh, subset of sub Q bar is a meaningful statement because is because we can prove that sub Q bar is actually homeomorphic to Cantor space and Cantor space and hence also sub Q bar has the property that every non empty open set is not meager. So that means, uh, so this uh, <clears throat> tells us that um, something about uh, that, that it makes sense to think of meager sets as being small. And the theorem, um, so one way to state the main theorem is that the elements in sub Q bar in the space sub Q bar in which OL is either existentially, and I haven't talked about it, but by doing things with complements, I can also, we can also handle the case of being defined just with for all quantifiers that either one of these uh, <clears throat> properties um, leads to a meager set. So the, so that, that means even though we can't really get our hands on any good examples, we would sort of assume that if that, I mean, this sort of says uh, that this should be uh, the common thing, that that should be the expected outcome. If you just give me a random field L that sits inside Q bar, the answer should be that the ring of integers is not existentially or un nor universally definable. Um, I can also do this more, we can do a more general version of this uh, by introducing, introducing the notion of a thin set. Um, so, but, uh, so this is a version I can um, state pretty nicely. And so um, I wanna just concentrate now on the special case where I'm only dealing with the existential definition and leave out the for all definition. Um, the doesn't really, it, it just adds uh, more notation. So I wanna show that the uh, fields inside Q bar that have the property that their rings of integers is the existentially definable in L is meager. Um, yeah, sorry for like uh, stating this um, so many times. It's, it's very hard to figure out how to do this in like a Zoom talk um, on the blackboard. You can sort of leave one thing up and then like people can just look at it over and over again. But uh, if I have it on like a previous slide and I refer to it 10 minutes later, it's hard uh, uh, to make sure it, everyone still remembers. So here, here we go again. So we have this set and we want to show it's meager. And um, so where does the, so how would we prove something like that? Well, um, I'm claiming we can find some nowhere dense subsets and figure out uh, a countable union of things where it is contained. So, and, um, and the first proposition says a exactly that. So the first proposition, so basically the, we need two ingredients. And so this is the first one. So if I have two polynomials F and G, and now I'm not going to look at just an arbitrary existential formula that might define um, my ring I'm only going to look at something very special, namely something of the form beta, um, which just says uh, that, so it's of um, the free variable is X and it says uh, that F of X, Y one through Y M should be zero and G evaluated at X, Y one through Y M should not be zero. Uh, and uh, the only stipulation that I have is that F, I don't just need it to be irreducible over Q. I actually want it to be what's called absolutely irreducible. So I want it to still be an irreducible polynomial over the algebraic closure. 
And then I'm claiming that I can write down a set that's nowhere dense, namely for each element X and Q, I can see if beta of X holds in a fixed number field L, and I can write down all the X's for which beta X holds in a given number field L. Now, that could be a subset of Z or it could not be a subset of Z. Um, and I'm going to put the ones, the fields in the set as beta for which it's true, for which it is true that the collection of all rational numbers X in which, for which beta of X holds in L that that forms a subset of the integers. And uh, then the conclusion is, of the proposition is that this set is nowhere dense. Okay, so now um, I've talked about, this proposition only talks about very special formulas beta that might define something. And the second statement, this, which is the second ingredient into, for the proof is basically the one that says the betas that showed up in in this proposition for this pro, uh, for the first ingredient, those are the only ones you really have to consider. Namely, if the if uh, OL is existentially definable in my field L, then I can also find a formula that defines it that has exactly the shape of the proposition that I stated on the previous slide. So, and the only thing, so it has like, it has these two cases. So what's the other case? It, well, um, there's always the possibility if I have, that I have um, finite sets floating around that are also existentially definable. And so for that, those I can just always take care of by saying X equals whatever the element is that I have there. So, um, so I just, so something like that, I might have a few points separately float somewhere that are handled by one and then everything else is handled by this condition two. So, so again, so the normal form theorem just says, um, if we have an existential definition, we can find one of a very special form. Uh, and the very special form lets us conclude something about uh, the, uh, the size of it, namely that um, it's nowhere dense. And so, um, so how do we put these two things together, these two ingredients to prove the theorem? So, what I'm going to do is, what I'm able to do is, I'm able to write down a candidate set that is meager and that contains all the sets in which the ring of integers is existentially definable. Namely, I'm just going to take, I'm claiming that the union over all the S beta works. So here, S beta is the um, is the um, set of the elements, rational elements, so that beta of x holds in L, and we only want to pick out the fields L, so that the subset lies inside the integers. And uh, and what I'm claiming is that the set of all fields that have this definability property is equal exactly to, or excuse me, is contained in, is contained in the union of the S beta. Now, uh, so if we can prove the claim, then we're done. Uh, because we're trying to prove that this set S here is meager.
And we know from one that each of these pieces is nowhere dense. So that means uh, uh, then we have our target set S contained in a union of nowhere dense set, and that's exactly what we want. So, okay, so let's see how we can prove this claim. So, let me just assume by contradiction that there is a field L in which I can define OL existentially, but it's not in this union that I had written down. And now what I'm so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, now use the fact that if my ring of integers is existentially definable, I can now find a special uh, formula that just defines the ring of integers, namely one that has either the shape that it's just a constant or it's of this form uh, f equal to zero g not equal to zero and f is this absolutely irreducible polynomial. So, so that means now by two, I can now find a special alpha that has the shape that I described. And so the only thing I need to notice is that, so there may be some of these terms might be constant terms, um, but since I have an infinite set here, they can't all be, not all the beta i's can fall into the first category because that would only give me finitely many elements. And so I must have at least one of the eyes being of the shape in two. And so I can just look at that and get my contradiction from that. So since OL is an infinite set, one of the beta eyes must be of this form, the second form. So, and our, we had assumed by contradiction that L is not in the union of these sets as beta. So in particular, L is not in this set S beta I for this specific beta I that shows up in my definition of the ring of integers.
But if I sort of, if I recall what S beta I was, I see that now I'm actually in trouble because by definition, S beta I was exactly the set of fields where the rational numbers for which beta I holds form a subset of the integers. But now I'm saying L is not in that. So that means there exists an element that's not an integer. So a rational number that is not an integer such that beta of i of x holds an L. And since the formula that defines the ring of integers is just this disjunction of all the beta i's, that means also, so let me, it's not just true that beta i of x holds an L, it's also true that alpha of x holds an L. Well, and this is where we get our contradiction because now we have a formula alpha that defines the ring of integers, but it's satisfied by something that's a rational number that's not in Z and so such elements are not in OL. So, so let me just say that. So, so alpha of X defines OL in L by assumption. And it's true for all of these integers, ring of integers, their intersection with the ground field Q is just the integers Z. And so this gives us contradiction because we got an element that's in the complement of the rationals excuse me, in the complement of the integers inside the rationals such that alpha x holds and such uh, an element is not allowed to exist if alpha is really supposed to define the ring of integers. So this is the proof sketch and um, it sort of um, is a very, so it's sort of um, what we can see from this is that we don't really, we didn't really need this ring that we wanted to define to be the ring of integers. It could have been any other object or even like, it doesn't even have to be a ring. The only property that we really needed was that if we cut down and intersected with, intersected with the rationals, we only get the integers. So that sort of means that um, while we're not able to um, say something for like a specific fields and only can say something about the collection, now we can also say something more general about what kind of things we can only define um, on, uh, for a meager subset of fields inside Q, um, Q bar. So there are several ways that this can go. So first of all, we can also, we don't actually have to work with the, uh, just the fields. We can also do the fields up to isomorphism. Um, so when you talk about isomorphism classes of fields and 
Um, like I said, um, the main theorem, the proof actually shows that something even stronger holds, namely that we, if we have any infinite subset of a field L that's existentially definable, then it must lie in this union of these sets as beta that I constructed. So it's not just, um, uh, and then we also have the same, we have an analogous statement for things that are uh, universally definable. Um, now, um, you could ask how about uh, first order definability? Um, so after, um, so um, my colleague, Linda Westrick, who was a co-author on this paper after Linda gave a talk at the MSI um, semester last um, fall on this topic, um, Arno Fame and Philip Dittman showed using completely different methods that the, if you look at the sets of fields in sub Q bar, where you're not just considering existential or universal definability, but now just straight first order definability, that's still a meager subset. Uh, but uh, their me method is more specific that like they really need things to be rings in there so they can't um, do something with just sets. And uh, so now sort of the, um, I wanna just spend uh, the last um, couple of minutes um, talking a little bit about how you would um, prove either one of these um, uh, main ingredients or like at least say what goes into them. So looking at the normal form theorem for existential definitions, um, so what we were able to do was we were able to um, first using a well, like a well ordering on the set of polynomials called the multi-degree, we defined the rank of uh, existential formula that's in a certain shape and then showed that this gives a weld ordering on all uh, existential formulas of a certain shape. And so that means um, this, what, what ends up happening is that the alpha of X that defines the, that um, is the one that we pick out, that's the one with minimal rank. So, so that means, uh, so the normal form theorem um, um, relies on um, a definition of a rank of a formula uh, and, and the one that we pick out is the one, is, is the one that minimizes the rank. Um, and then the first proposition is the one where probably, so the, um, most of the number theory is happening um, because the first proposition relies on what's called the Hilbert irreducibility theorem. Um, and it uses the fact that both the integers and their complement are not thin. Um, and so what, what's the property that we need here without going into too many details? What we need is that if we specialize this polynomial, say F, at a bunch of variables, like we're gonna specify it at all but the last one, we want the resulting polynomial to still be irreducible. So I have a polynomial in many variables and I'm plugging in values for all but one of the variables and I wanna know is the resulting, what are the chances that the uh, resulting polynomial in one variable is still ir an irreducible polynomial and, and so the, the fact that Z has this thinness property allows us uh, 
to like means that this is going to happen uh, very often. And with that, we can control whether certain fields we construct in the proof of this proposition, uh, what their intersections look like, uh, whether they contain given field, uh, elements uh, that we prescribed or not. So I think I'm going to uh, leave it here and uh, stop. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, so are there um, questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So you uh, basically laid out why the out of all the infinite algebraic extensions, the, the, there's only like it, the set of them for which the ring of integers is either existentially or universally definable is small in some sense. But do we know that it's non-empty, at least in the case of infinite algebraic extensions? Um, so... I There are some, I don't know if we have any universal definitions in infinite cases or I think in the infinite cases, everything is first order currently. So. I think there are um, in like Sasha Schlappentock's work, I think there are some like, um, Sigma two definabilities in there, but right, but I don't think they're. But so you were asking about existential, though, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I'm not. I don't. Yeah, it's a good. I don't. I'm not aware. Yeah. Everything. So I mean, a, yeah, I mean. Um, I don't know if, if there is some sort of not interesting, not so interesting example that you can construct of an infinite extension where it's existentially definable, but I would have to think about that. I, I'm i not sure if anybody would conjecture that that set would be empty if you just intersected with the infinite extensions, but I don't see, yeah, like an obvious example to, uh, Uh, Peter, you have your hand raised. you want to go ahead? Yes. Um, so what I get from your comment are our finite extensions where which are actually where the integers are actually existential definable. Uh, universally. Universally. Yeah. So for pure existential definability, it's entirely open whether the set is non-empty or not. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it could be a very uninteresting meager set if you just look at the existentially definable ones. Yep. Okay, now the other point is all of this program arises out of a reductionary approach of proving undecidability of Hilbert 10 based on the Matyacevich result. Um, are there any um, extensions of the undecidability known, which are of a different nature, which don't use such a reductionary approach. So, for example, are there rings of integers for which it has shown to be undecidable? Yes, and 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 that is so. So the problem. If, if you are willing to assume the shafarevich tate conjecture, which says something about the um, uh, torsion on elliptic curves, um, then Hilbert's 10th problem is undecidable for any rings of, for the ring of integers in any number field, so in any finite extension of Q. Um, so, and, and that's why also it would be immediately of interest if, if you had, if you knew the answer of the existential definability for one of these OLs that correspond to a finite extension. Um, but 
everything, all of those results for rings of integers, again, were obtained through reduction arguments, something more sophisticated than the uh, giving a positive existential definition of Z inside these rings, but something called a Diophantine model of Z, but it's still the same idea. It's um, uses as a black box Matyasevich's original result. So uh, there is no, there are no generalizations which go even a step farther back by looking at the combinatorial argument underneath, you would define it combinatorics of encoding machine computations. Yeah, so I think um, I occasionally have these conversations with people that say, oh, why don't you like, rather than just like using Matyasevich's result, why don't you pick like another result that's another problem that's undecidable and use that for the reduction as your black box? Isn't, shouldn't that be possible? But I don't think anyone has actually ever worked this out or like you su suggested, gone back to the Turing machine with actually the computations. So um, it's not clear to me which one would be one to try that would sort of help with this. If you go to the exponential Diophantine equations, so the first yeah. step, the original yeah. Davis Putnam, Julia Robinson result. Right. Is that is there are there cases known where it generalizes for algebraic extensions? Yeah, they're all um, all the um, proofs of the form of defining C, Z inside your extension in some form, positive okay. existentially. Well, and that's sort of where the number theory part comes in because then people like use Pell equations or elliptic curves or like things like that to define these things. But sort of n none of these generalizations are like back from first principles and sort of using like the machinery that was done. But I guess it's also because the original proof gave something much stronger where they showed that every um, RE set is in fact Diophantine. And that's not necessarily true for these generalizations for which we have undecidability. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there other questions? Well, if not, let's thank yeah, you. So could I ask a question? Yeah, Sorry. So I, I remember at Linda's talk at MSRI, mm -hmm. there was a, uh, a number theorist from Penn who seemed to suggested that the result should be generalizable to much more abstract settings. Uh, and I was wondering if you had had a chance to look at that, if, the, if that panned out. It just seemed quite <laughs> surprising or interesting. So, so I think you're referring to Florian Pup. Yes, I couldn't um, remember. And, yes. and um, so Florian brought up that, um, so he um, pointed out to us, so the question is, um, this topology that we're looking at, has this already been studied by other people? Is this a common, is this like a well-known topology with well-known properties? And um, it turns out that if you use the Galois correspondence between the uh, intermediate fields um, between Q and Q bar, and the closed subgroups of the absolute Galois groups, uh, then you can show that this coincides with what is called the Viatoris topology on the space of closed subgroups of Galois group of Q bar over Q. So, so that means, um, so we, we looked into that and um, uh, so it's very nice that there is this correspondence, 
but um, I don't think it led to any further insights in terms of being able to generalize aspect. It's just sort of uh, uh, it's just sort of nice that the the topology we're using can also uh, be understood as this topology on the space of closed subgroups of the Galois, absolute Galois group. Yeah. So this, I think Florian Popp, I think called it the strict topology in one of his papers. And then another paper refers to it as the, as the via torus topology. Yeah. So, so we did update our paper with that, but uh, it's, it hasn't really led to any new results it didn't, or generalizations. Yeah, it, it didn't mean that you could use the uh, complicated um, ranking in this other, in more general settings, and you couldn't. Uh... At least, it was, yeah, at least so, so far. far. Yeah, yeah, no, I yeah. just, okay. Are there okay. other questions? Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Kirsten again. Thank you. Uh, and I think we can stop the recording and